Praise the Lord. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's good to be here tonight with you all. All right, so give me one moment. Let me set my screen and we will get going. Okay. Give me one moment. Good. All right. I think this is perfect. Okay. So praise the Lord, everybody. Just let me get this link out to everyone that is waiting to join us tonight. Mm -hmm. Everyone. So we have sound. Good. All right, so that is done. I have one more. Okay, so I've done that. I've done that when um, on Facebook. I have to send to my groups. Thank you for your patience. Oh. I know nobody's here yet, but I see that because I know some people watch it later and I don't want them wondering why it was so quiet. Okay. Did I miss anyone? Hi, Auntie Alice. Good evening. The Lord bless you, Ma. Thank you for joining us. Got one more to send the serial news. Yep, this one. Praise God. Praise the name of Jesus. Let us pray, mighty Father. We thank you. We give you glory and honor. We bless your holy name. We thank you for bringing us here tonight, another Wednesday in your presence. Lord, take preeminence. We cover this uh, program tonight with the blood of Jesus. We ask for leading and direction from you, O oh Father. And in all of this, take all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, Andre. The Lord bless you. Thank you for joining. That's my son. Um, there was one group I didn't send it to, I think. All right, that's gone there. I have a feeling there's something I'm forgetting and 
They're gonna call me later on and say, you didn't send the link to us. Okay, I did that. Good, I sent it. All right, praise God. All right, so welcome to the Thornwell World Ministries. This is, we're not a church. I say this for those who are joining us for the first time. Our regular people know that we're not a church. We're an evangelistic ministry. So we meet here on Mondays and Wednesdays to pray and to talk about the things of God, encourage each other to come into his presence and worship him. Hallelujah. That is what we do. So that's why we're here tonight. So we are the Throne Room Ministries. We... Let me first of all show you what our what we stand on as our word. This is what our ministry stands by. John 4 23, it says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. That is the reason the program you're watching tonight is called Created for Fellowship with God. God desires that is children come together to worship, to fellowship with him. And this is the creed that we stand on. It guides every action we take. It guides everything we say. Every word we speak is guided by this scripture, by this creed. Uh, we believe in God as our father. We believe that Christ is our Lord and savior. We believe he died for our sins to reconcile us back to the kingdom of God. We believe in his name and he gave us the right to be called the children of God. So if you believe this, then you are one of us. And we're excited to have you join us tonight. Hallelujah. All right, so let's get on with tonight's program. Our topic for conversation today is that manipulation, the art of witchcraft. It is an art of witchcraft. The Bible says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Whereby they lie in wait. To deceive. But he's asking us not to be like children. Do you remember when we did malice? When we did malice, Paul said the same thing, that we should not be like children. He said, in children, be. In, in malice, be like children. Right? But in other things, the things of the Lord. We should be grown up. We should act like men. Here is telling us the same thing. The same thing. That's what he's saying, that we shouldn't be like children. So he's always equating the things of God in the eyes of children, like the word of God. So there are times when we need to be like children when it comes to taking things, allowing evil into our lives, right? We should not be like children, but we should be like children when it comes to the things of the kingdom. We should be willing and ready to accept the things of the kingdom with a pure heart. But in this matter, Paul says, do not be like children. Do not be like children. Let's continue. I pulled up another scripture and it says Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26, 23. You know what? Let me give you this first scripture that I just read. Ephesians. 
Praise God. Mm -hmm. Let me pull this here. So I've pulled that scripture. And in Proverbs 26, verse 23, it says, Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot shirt covered with silver gloss. A pot shirt is a clay pot. That's what that means. A clay pot that is covered with rust, that has been left out, covered with rust. That's what it's referring to. It's a burning lips and a wicked heart. Lips that are quick to tell lies. Weak, lips that are quick to, to speak evil. Because it comes from a wicked heart. It says it's like a pot shed that is covered with silver glass. Manipulation, the art of witchcraft. I want us to talk a little bit. You know, when you think about... Um, a lawyer, what what comes to your mind when they say, oh, it's such a great lawyer, or you look at a lawyer in, in a, in a, during a case, what are the things that you see that you find enticing, that captivates the people? And some say, wow, he's such a great lawyer. Um, let's make this interactive. So speak, talk to me, please. What, when you think about a good lawyer, you watch a lawyer win a case, what would be the things that would be compelling that you would think, say, he was good at this? So, you know, that would make you think he was a good lawyer. Let's talk a little bit. For me personally, it would be one of them would be to say he, all right, the way he dissected the truth, right? the way he spoke about the story, the way he painted the picture that even though you were not there, right, you could tell what happened based on how he explained it, based on the story that the lawyer showed, told in the court, the way he told the story, the way it came across, how convincing he was with the facts according to him that he showed the people, how he explained everything how colorful he was, how animated he was, why he was trying to sell his story. So when he wins the case, people say, wow, he was such a good lawyer. God bless you, Sister Felicity and your husband. Yes, the Lord watch over you. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Tayo. Yes, Auntie Alice, you said he is convincing. Yes, he is convincing. The lawyer was convincing about how he told the story. He painted a picture. Everybody bought the picture, right? We saw it. We saw, we felt as if we were part of, the, of everything that was happening. Our topic tonight is manipulation. Good evening, Uncle Solo. Good evening. The Lord bless you. So he dissected the truth according to him. He told the story according to his own convictions. He told us he painted the picture the way he see it. He, see, he, he sees the picture the way he saw it. He sold it that way to us. Hi, Shana. Okay, that's my daughter. So today I have a full house. My whole family is here. God bless you all. Thank you for the encouragement. You know, he painted that story for us and we bought it. Well, most lawyers become great it's not because of the truth they are telling the law lawyers will win a case so maybe i should not say most um, and please take this in the context in which i am saying so i don't want them to send me an email or telling me about how i'm defining lord lawyers okay so the law lawyers would say they become they, they they're known to be great because they have the ability to explain. They have the ability to dissect. They have the ability to paint a story. 
right? And it is because they have mastered something. How many times have we watched a case and the, uh, a lawyer is questioning a, a, a defendant or somebody or a witness and the witness says something and the lawyer spins it in a way and then the person will say, that's not what I said. Or they will say, just answer yes or no. Because answering yes or no helps them paint the picture they're trying to sell to the jurors. If we explain, it takes away from their story. It does not have the same edge anymore. So they have mastered the art of manipulating words. They have learned how to take control of an environment and spin it to suit their purpose. They have mastered how to twist the truth. It is the truth. They just manipulate it. They just twist it. There are people who have mastered that as an art. Like you have a sculptor that will take wood or take stone and sculpt it into an image that you will look and say, wow. There are people who can use words that same way. They can put words together. They can twist what people say as an art and sell it to you and you believe it. That's what they do. So what is manipulation? As I was thinking about this, the Lord gave me a quote to describe what I just talked about. So I want to show it to you here. Okay. So it says manipulation is an art that is perfected. It is perfected by those who engage in it. It is not a complete lie, but a skillful weaving of the lie within the truth. It's a shifting of the truth. They are not lying. They're just weaving stories. They're just weaving things into the truth so that it suits their purpose. That is what the art of manipulation is. They have perfected it. Amen? But that's not what we want to do as children of God. Because not, it, it does not glorify God when we do that. We have to understand that, as I said, it's not telling a lie. It's twisting the truth. Sister Eunice, good evening. The Lord bless you. It's not telling a lie. It is twisting the truth. Because that's what makes it believable. If we tell a lie, you have to work more to convince people. But it is the truth that is already in the story that makes it convincing. Some people say they stretch it. Yeah, I didn't lie. I just stretched it a little bit. Why? Because it suits their purpose to stretch the lie. That's what we do. So we stick to aspects of the truth and twist it. The rest, that way, the people we are talking to, we're able to sell them that story. <laughs> yes, exactly. My daughter just said something and I'm going to get to that story. See, she said, that is what the enemy did in the beginning of Genesis with Eve. That's exactly what he did. He didn't lie. He just twisted the truth a little bit. And Eve, we all know the story, but we will get there. We'll get there. So the reason for manipulation, why does a lawyer go to court and tell all the stories and dramatize this and build up, you know, rev the people, is to keep him in control. He has a narrative that he wants to tell the world. He has a narrative that he wants to sell to the jurors. So, but to do that, he needs to be in control. So 
He goes there and captivates the action, the attention of the people by telling them what he thinks is enticing. By giving them a spin of the actual truth to keep them enticed. Now he has their attention. He controls that attention. What are the things when we say we, we, we manipulate to be in control? Somebody's manipulating to be in control. They want to be in control of the mind of a person. They want to be in control of a heart, of the heart of a person. They want to be in control of a situation. So these are all the things that the Lord works on. The mind is renewed in Romans when we become Christians. Old things have passed away, right? All things have become new. The Spirit of God renews our mind. But then the enemy, no, wants the mind. Because as long as he has control of the mind, the mind cannot be renewed. The enemy wants the heart, manipulates the heart of people, because as long as he has the heart of God's people, the heart cannot become contrite. The heart becomes a heart of stone. So he does everything to stay in control of the mind of the heart. Three, the situation. Because it is the situation that speaks into the mind. It is the situation that brings the thoughts into the mind. It is the situation that allows the seeds to be planted into the heart. So when it controls the situation, it controls the narrative, then it prompts you as to what you need to think, how you need to think, and what you need to allow in your heart, the kind of thoughts you need to dwell on so that seeds are sown that are not good. Let's look at the tools that the enemy engages in this manipulation. Affections, our affections. The enemy uses affection. The enemy uses status and power. The enemy uses wealth. I separated it for a reason. You see, affection, have you met people, let's say for example, men who go after women, for certain things. It could be for sex. It could be for their wealth. It could be for anything. These are women they believe are lacking in affection. They need attention. Men don't look at them. Maybe even family members have abandoned them. So what do they do? They come into that person's life and they shower them. With, with affection, what they know they are looking for, they will give them that. People can manipulate others because of their status. That gives them power. Celebrities, we watch them on TV all the time. They go on Facebook, they go on TikTok, they go on YouTube, they sell products, they sell things. They Because we see them use them, we assume this is good for me. And they use their celebrity power, their status, to get people to do their bid. When they say, we're going to cut this person off, we're going to destroy this business, they manipulate their followers and they get them to do it. People in power get other people to do evil things. Go kill for them. Go kidnap for them. People use fear. To manipulate others. If they think this person can do evil to them, can do them harm, they get them able to manipulate them to do what they need them to do. People use their wealth to control others, the, the actions of others. It's another form of manipulation. They do it in the world. They do it in the church, in the house of God. Where they go there, they shower gifts on ministers, they shower gifts on spiritual leaders so they don't have the voice to say anything and they do whatever they need to do in the house of God. They are in, in uh, among their relatives. They make themselves the kings and the queens of the clan, of their, their families because of this position of their wealth. Nobody is able to talk for the fear of if I speak, they won't give me what they used to give me. 
and I need it. So poverty is one tool the wealth uses to manipulate poor people. So now we know the tools. We know what can be manipulated, the mind, the heart, the situation our circumstances can be manipulated. Can we think of something else that someone can use to manipulate another person? If you think of anything that a person can use to manipulate another, another tool that can be engaged, put in the post. The other thing I want us to think about, how the manipulator works. A relationship, yes. A relationship. Yeah. So that comes under the plea of affection. People can use a, a manipulate others through relationship. So you see, when the manipulator comes in, for them to do what they need to do, they first of all need. I'm taking steps to go through all this because I call this an art. It means it has been studied. It has been strategized. It's not random. A manipulator does not act randomly. They've taken their time to, do, to put in place certain steps, certain things they need to do to get at their victim, to get to their end goal. That is why even in the court, when the lawyer is speaking, he looks around. He has his, his co-chairs that are looking around to see the reaction of the jurors to see if they need to strain, if that strategy, the first one they employed, is not working, they're not getting the desired effect. The jurors are not biting the bait. They talk to each other. They talk to each other to switch, to try something else. Yes, Uncle Solo, past experiences can be used to manipulate people. People know your story. People know that if they say something about you, they tell, if, if they threaten to tell somebody about you or something they know about you, you will not want that. You don't want the world to know your, your hidden skeletons in your cupboard. They will use those past experience, that past knowledge of you to tell the world and shame you. And you wanting to prevent that from happening, you fall into the trap of a manipulator. So yes, past experiences. So this is how the manipulator works. They first of all identify who they are looking for, what they, are, what they want done. They sit about, around and think about, well, this is my goal. This is what I need to achieve. Identifying what they need. Then they go out to case, see who is available. They observe because they want to know what your vulnerabilities are. They want to know what makes you vulnerable. So they're not in a rush. They say they have patience. That is why when, 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 in, when people target jewels to see the ones that can be bought, they send people out even by the time they're, they're sourcing who the, the jewels are going to be. They have private ins investigators who go around to check them out to see, okay, they have children, he drives a battered car, so he might need a car. They want their background to see, does he have debts that need to be paid? So they know that if I offer him money, he's susceptible, he can accept it. Why? He's in desperate need. Maybe he has a sick mother or sick father or a child that is problematic, something is going on. So they do their homework. That way, when they get to the jewel that is vulnerable and they think they can buy them, they know for a fact that this one is buyable. They can buy this person. Why? They are desperate. They've observed their pattern. They're struggling to buy food. They're struggling to pay their rent. They're struggling to put gas in their car. Their car is giving them issues all the time. They need to change the car. So imagine somebody like that being offered. Well, if you go and swing the case in our favor, we'll give you 150000 
that person begins to think, okay, I can buy a new car. I can renovate my house. That roof that is leaking. My child that needs to go to college. My child that needs to that. My husband that needs that. That surgery that, you know, you see how they're doing all the calculation. 150,000 is a lot of money. So they buy that person. How was them? Were they manipulated? Poverty. Somebody used their wealth to manipulate their status, their own poverty, and got them. But that will not be a portion. They, they use their status in society. Yes, ma'am. They use their status in society. We see that happening right now all, all over the place. Manipulation in the government towards the less fortunate. Yeah. In a social in a social life right now, you go out there. For example, this month is uh, Pride Month. You hear all kinds of things, and they they, they try to shut you, the Christian, of the so they, they don't want us to speak. Why? When we speak, we say we are against them. We are against them. So you 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 are afraid to speak, so you don't get fired at your place of work. You are afraid to even when comments are made on Facebook that are derogatory to the Christian, that are terrible. A Christian is afraid to respond. Why? If I respond, they think I'm picking on this one. It could get out of hand. Other people will turn against me and do things or say things, and I become the victim. We're seeing all that done. When you're in a place of work, you refuse to participate. You're manipulated into doing it because you don't want to seem as the one that is against them. Then they find lawsuits of discrimination and all that. That's manipulation. You know, so this manipulator will first of all identify and target. After they've identified the problem, they've identified the person, they look for their target and embrace the target. How do they do that? They come now and establish themselves. They become a friend. The gentle helper at a store, when you're walking around and your bag falls, oh, they help you to pick it up, put things together. You are trying to buy something, your hand, you can't reach the top shelf. Or somebody's willing to, you begin to notice that every time you turn, there's somebody around waiting to, to, to assist you. There's this nice, pleasant woman. Or don't, It's not just men that are manipulators or even women. In fact, those are the dangerous ones when a woman is a manipulator. Because women have skills to nurture that men don't have. We are born to nurture. That's why God gave us a womb. So there's an aspect of nurturing that we have that is lacking in the men. When they put their skills to manipulating all that is deadly, that will not be a portion in Jesus' name. You see? So women can be manipulators too. They're willing to do everything for you, to assist you, to make you comfortable, to help you get to where you need to be. Once they have accomplished that, they move to a second stage where they'll seclude you. You might not realize they're secluding you, just that the people around you realize that they can't, they don't see you as much as they used to. Why? This new friend that you have all of a sudden has become your everything. By the time you blink, she's there or he's there. You need a cup of water, they're giving it to you. Or you need a ride to the store, they're taking you. You want to go to church, or they will take you. Just that you're always with them. They're always by you. Wherever you go, they're there. You, you keep bumping into them in places. That you never noticed them before. Why? Because they observed you. They know where you are at each time. They know that your daily activity is in the morning I wake up, I run, I do this, do this, do this, and I get to leave my house to go buy gas. So they're waiting for you at the gas station. They might skip the next stop so it doesn't look too obvious. Then the next time they see you will be when you are having lunch. You're the restaurant you usually have lunch, they will show up there. Oh, you this is where you are. Oh, they come here every day, but you've never seen them. And then they sit and chat. They're establishing friendship. Once that control, they've, they've been able to establish that friendship. I am talking about that because it's important. The Bible says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. The children of God, we're very naive and gullible. Yes, Christ wants us to be childlike, but it's the Bible that tells us that what should we be? He said, Be, be as wise as a serpent. 
gentle as a lamb, but wise as a serpent. So we should be aware of our environment and the people around us so we don't fall prey into the traps of the enemy. Do not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. The word of God. That is why I'm going to all this. So we see the kind of planning. When you see things begin to happen around you in your life, you're wondering, why am I this? Why is this? Why is this? Why am I not seeing my friends? My usual friends are not around me anymore. My, my, you know, things are just changing. Something happened. There is an anomaly. A person came into your life. A situation has changed in your life that has kept people away. Those who were cared for you, those who were walking around you, those who were assisting you and doing the things you need to do, you don't see them anymore. It is because there's a voice somewhere that is stopping them. There's, so, there's, there's an obstacle that has been put that is preventing that person from getting close to you. So there's manipulation in every sector. Let me put this up. There's manipulation in every sector in life, in churches, schools, on the television, with the arts, workplace, families, with husband and wives. Yes, and children, you name it. It's all, it's everywhere. That is true. That is true. There is no one that can manipulate the husband more than the wife, the same way that uh, the one that can manipulate the wife more than the husband. Why? We know each other. We know which buttons to press. We know what to do when we want something. We know. So that is true. And children know how to manipulate their parents. The same way parents know how to manipulate their children when they want to get things, especially their grown-up children, by making them feel guilty about everything. That's one way. Guilt. We guilt our children into doing things. We guilt our husbands into doing things. We guilt our wives into doing things that they don't want to do for our own pleasure. And God is watching us. God is watching us. So after this friendship has been maintained now, you know, they've occupied, they're occupying your time. They're keeping everyone away from you. Then they begin to exploit you. You will just realize that when you go out to the restaurant to eat, they're not paying anymore. They begin to order for you. And as they're ordering for you, they're ordering their food. And what happens? You end up paying the bill. You go to the store to go buy things. Oh, they pick up a one or two or a few things and add it to your cart. Then you end up paying for that. You know, they're making plans, but they're inviting you. Not because they want you, because they want you to fit the bill. That is the reason they're making their plans. Oh, what are you doing on Saturday? I was thinking that we could go. Oh, nothing. Okay, that's good. Then I think we, we can go to so-and-so place. And then you come along. What you don't realize is that you are the one that is financing their whole life. Then they begin to bring sob stories about why they're not able to pay their bill, you know, they lost their job and this is happening, their mother is sick, their father is dying somewhere, their sister is that, all kinds of stories. All of a sudden their world is crashing and they need to borrow money from you, they need to borrow your car, they need to, the car they were using because they were renting it, it was just a, a loop to catch you in. They've returned the car. Now they're coming to borrow your car, my car's a problem, it's in the garage, it's going to cost 3,500 to fix. Am I painting the picture? Have we met anyone in life that is that person? It happens. So let's not be deceived. And once they've done that, they maintain control. They maintain control by making sure you don't get to meet the people you know, the people who know you don't come around you, because if they do, they will tell you something is wrong. They begin to sow seeds of discord between you and your loved ones to separate you. That's how they maintain control. They sow seeds. They tell you things. Do you know when you were not there, so and so person said that this is a sister I was close to. Now, all of a sudden, a new sister is telling me what that sister said when I was not around, what they did. Why would you let her do that to you? They begin to sow seeds in your heart that will cause you to look at that sister that was your best friend all this time. And you begin to hate them. You begin to resent them and separation. And what you don't know is as they're talking to you, they're talking to that sister. Because it's a wedge, they're putting a divider to separate. 
to settle it. All an art to manipulate you. We have to remember that when people manipulate us, they use what is important to us. It's not random. That is why they study your patterns. They study what you like, what you don't like. And they make sure they maintain control by ensuring you become more and more dependent. The more friends you lose, the more dependent you are on them to take it, to take the place. They make sure when the friend that you used to cry on their shoulder is gone, they provide their shoulders. The friend who used to accompany you to the store is no longer there because they've driven them away. They are there to take you to the store. The friend who would make the, your favorite food that you like has been driven away. They're there to ensure that that food you're looking for is provided. So they become your everything. That's how they maintain control. Yeah. Yes, sister. Sometimes we think we can, ma ma we can manipulate God. But that is not true. So now let's go... So what I want to talk about, the Bible says, everything I've talked about is anything good. Is any part of that that I've explained good? Is, do you hear of any attribute of that person, anything they have done that is good, that would please God? That God will look at that person and say, a child of the kingdom. No, none of that. It is because that person belongs to another kingdom. And that kingdom has a father. John chapter 8, verse 44. He says, I'm going to use the, the, the new uh, NIV version. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You see that? So a manipulator belongs to the devil. The devil is his father. He carries out the desires of his father. The manipulator does not hold onto the truth. He twists the truth. He divides the truth and sows evil within the truth. It says when he lies, he speaks his native language. You know how we say when we when when we are upset or we are sad and we want to talk, we revert to our native language, right? Because it flows fluently. Even when we are sad and we want to talk to God, we we forget to speak English. We go to our dialect because that is our native language. When for the enemy, have you met the Jamaican who speaks English perfectly? You can you couldn't tell that they are Jamaican, and somebody pinches something that is very important to them, you will hear that the, it's coming from the back of their throats. The sound of their patois it will come from the back of their throats to come slap you in the face. You will be confused to say, what happened to your, your British accent? What happened to your American accent? That's how we do. And it's the same thing for the, the, the devil. His native language is lies. So children of the devil, their native language is lies. Their native language is to kill. It's second nature to them. They are murderers, they are deceivers, they don't hold on to the truth, they are killers because they are sons and daughters of their father, the devil. Let us see how the devil works the exact same way the manipulator does. My daughter mentions the story of Adam and Eve. You see, when I talked about identify and target, it says in Job chapter one, verse seven, and the Lord said unto Satan, where are you coming from? Then Satan said, from going to and fro in the earth. 
and from walking up and down in it. Now, when you go to, he has a purpose for doing that, going to and fro and up and down. In 1 Peter 5, 8, we are told why the devil is going to and fro and up and down. Because the Bible wants us in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant, which is what we are talking about. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, the one that is fighting against you, the one that is fighting against the purpose of God in your life, getting to that, that end that God wants for you. He says, as a roaring lion, he has a roaring lion because he tries to imitate God. God is the lion of Judah, but he walks as the roaring lion. He says, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. When the manipulator is walking to and fro, looking for who to identify, what is he trying to do? What are they trying to do? They're looking for who to destroy. That's what they're doing. So, like father, like child. The enemy too is going to and fro, seeking whom he will devour. And then what does he do? He establishes himself once he finds a home, once he finds a person, once he finds a vessel that he can possess, he establishes himself. That is the reason we have to be careful what we do, who we mingle with, what the doors we open into our life, the places we go to, the words we say. The way we dress as children of God. I go back to that all the time. Because when you dress the wrong way, the wrong people look at you. You, you, you call the wrong attention to yourself. It doesn't mean that because you dress appropriately, people won't look at you. And they have to be blind. But we have to be conscious of what we put on that attracts the kind of attention that they attract. So the enemy will establish himself once a door is open he's going around he doesn't walk in unless he's invited our action invites him our words invite him our thoughts invite him because when you think it a lot then you begin to say it and you begin to act it then he comes in then the devil comes in and establishes let's make an example he establishes himself the story of um, Adam and Eve that my daughter was, uh, was talking about, even the devil. It says here that the devil is subtle, more subtle than any other beast. The devil more subtle than any other beast of the field which the Lord had made. He came to the woman and said to her, did God, I'm going to paraphrase, I don't want to read the whole scripture. Did God tell you not to eat of any tree of the garden? Did God tell you not to eat? Because you see, he's, 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 what he's doing is, is investigating, he's exploring, he's looking. He's looking to see where can I come in here? Where do I have room to slide in? The same way the manipulator would come into somebody's life, they're looking for the vulnerabilities. Where do, the, where, where do I fit? Where do they fit? That's what the enemy is looking for. That's what he was looking for with Eve. Where can I slide in? Where can I find my position? And that's what he did. So did God say you cannot eat from any of these trees? Did the Lord tell you that? That's what he asked. Did the Lord tell you that? And then Eve said, hmm, well, he didn't say, uh, uh, um, yeah, he said we can eat from any of the trees, any, any of the trees, except... We can eat from any of the trees except. So the enemy just learned what the weakness was. He learned where he was coming in. You see? He just learned. Like the manipulator will find out the vulnerability of the person and slide in to fit there. It's the same way the enemy just discovered, okay, so this is my wing to come in. I'm going to come in this way. Since God has said they can eat from every tree except that tree. Why? And if she went out to tell him that if we eat from this tree, we will die. So you see how she provided everything? That's why the Bible warns us about he that keepeth his mouth, keepeth his life. She talked. She gave the enemy 
the womb to come in. She told him what made her vulnerable. She told him what he could use to set her to trip. And the devil said, you see, it became a seclusion. Now he anchored. They said that the serpent came and anchored next to her. Now we are bodies. So let's talk. Hmm. Did God say you would die? No, no, you won't die. You won't die. You will show. He said, you will not surely die. So he's saying it with certainty, convincing. You will not die. Why will you die? The only thing that will happen is when you eat from this tree, he says, your eyes will be opened. So the mistake Adam, Eve and Adam made was when God told them that if they eat, they will die. They didn't try to find out what kind of death God was talking about. Was it a physical death? Is it a spiritual death? Where they were supposed to have the, in the eye, the heart of God, the thoughts of God. So that would not occur to them. See? But when the devil told her, she didn't ask him, what do you mean our eyes will be opened? Are my eyes closed? Why didn't she ask, what do you mean my eyes will be opened? I can see you, so that means my eyes are opened. Why are you trying to convince me that my eyes will be opened when I can see you already? But he went further. He said, not only will your eyes be opened, you will become like small gods. Remember, Satan was thrown away from hell, from heaven. Why? He tried to be God. So he throws that at man all the time because in our hearts, we like to take glory for things. We like to be noticed. We like to be lifted. So he said, you will be like gods, like him. You will be like gods. You will know good from evil. In other words, you'll be able to decide what's good for you and what is not good for you. You don't need God to do that anymore. Does it sound familiar? Because now we don't need the devil to bring anything. We see it. We go and pick it up and we analyze it. Why is good for us? We analyze, we, we explain why we need this thing. We, our life will not be the same without it. Even though it's killing us. Even though it's, make, we, it's causing us to be sinners. It's causing us to backslide. We can tell. We, because of that new toy we found, we don't read our Bibles anymore. We don't pray anymore. In fact, we, we don't go to church anymore. We don't do anything anymore. We don't. We explain it. The way the devil explained it to Eve, what will happen, that's how we explain it to ourselves. We have become our own gods. We explain it to ourselves. Well, I need this because if I buy this, it will help my life better. I will live better. I'll be able to do this. I'll be able to do that. I'll be able to. All of the things we've told ourselves we'll be able to do has nothing to do with the things of God. And then we realize three weeks down that I know I haven't been to church. Oh, I haven't prayed. I haven't read my Bible. When was the last time? And you're wondering now why the devil is slapping us left, right, and center. Things are going elter skelter. You're wondering why. But we took God out of the equation. We have become our own gods. We are organizing our days. We are organizing our lives. We are doing everything that pleases us. That's what the enemy did. And the Bible says, when Eve saw that it was good to the eyes, it was good in her eyes. It was good. It was pleasing. She took it and she ate. Not only did she eat, she gave it to her husband and he ate too. So you see the control that the enemy took? He came into the garden that God put his children because of the loss of the eyes, the loss of the flesh, the greed of the heart. The enemy came in, felt their paws. See which one they will respond to. What is appealing to them? Is it the fruit that they've been told not to eat? Is it the God that they will be? Is it the knowledge of good, knowing that they will know good from evil, that they can make their own decisions? Which one? So he threw everything at them. He threw everything. And Eve grabbed and extended to the husband. See the art of manipulation. See it. And he got what he wanted. 
And he maintained control because now not only does he have Eve, he has Adam. It would have been tough to go now and convince. Now it would have been to say, okay, now we have to work with Eve to go work on Adam. No, you see, he got two for one. It's like a bogo. Buy one, get the other one half off. So he did less, he didn't even have to convince. Actually, that one was free. Buy one, get one free. He sold to Eve. Adam came with the package. He didn't have to say anything. And he maintained control. And you know how the enemy keeps people in control? By keeping them in sin. By giving them what is pleasing to their eyes. By giving them what is appealing to their heart. He maintains control of God's children. We have one foot here, one foot there. We are neither hot, we are neither cold. And God said, I will spit you out if you don't decide what you want to do. Because you cannot put clean water in a, in a, in a, in a, in a dirty bottle. It's no longer clean. That's what he did. There are other stories. If you read the story of Jezebel and King Ahab and Naboth, how he, the king wanted the land. Instead, they killed. The wife manipulated other people by her power because she was the queen. She got men to lie on Naboth to say he, cost, he, he, he blasphemed against God. And he was killed, took the land. If you read the story of in Esther chapter 6, where Haman thought that the king was going to bless him. He said, the king asked him, say, what do you think I should do to the man who, who the king is pleased with? And he thinking that the king was talking about him, gave him ideas, oh, put him on your best horse, give him your best dress, give him your best coat, oh, give him that, give him that, let him walk down the street and uh, let men rise up and, and scream his name. See, in his, in his mind, it was putting his thoughts into the heart of the king. But because the God we serve is the God that controls the hearts of king, God sent him to the right person, Haman, to feed him the information he needs because Haman will want the best for himself. And God only gives the best to his children. So he got the best from him. And when he says, I will give you the, 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 the what's the word he called? The, the, the heathen for your inheritance, he took from him and gave to his son, Mordecai. So the manipulation he was planning worked against him. We get the story of Rachel, Isaac and, and, and his son, and Rebecca, and the two children. How all that happened? The mother teaming up to get the blessing from her, the older son onto the younger one. But that's a story for another day. Because we have another topic coming up that we're going to talk about. When we try to be God's helpers, we're going to talk about that sometime later. You see? So we have to be careful. Samson and Delilah were another story. When you talk about vile affection, Samson kept going to a place where God did not want him to be. And the same woman manipulated him to the point where he was killed. He could not resist what was happening to him. He kept going. And every time he went, something would go wrong. Yet he kept going. And that cost him his life. It is the reason we have to be careful what we allow in our hearts. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That being said, you know what that means? Let's look at it this way. Where your treasure is, is where your heart will be also. If the enemy finds out what you treasure, it pulls your heart towards it. If it is affection because we are desperate to marry, I'm thankful as I'm married. And I'm not playing now. I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad or feel uh, terrible about themselves. If the enemy feels that you are desperate for a husband, he will bring the son of Jezebel to you 
but he will be the best man that you will ever know until you marry him. The same way a man who is looking for a, a sexy wife, she has to be beautiful. She has to have big boobs and a tiny waist. Oh, yes, the devil will bring that one for you. But I guarantee you, there will be 12 of you who will be seeing that tiny waist and big boobs. Will make your life hell. Yes, the enemy will present himself in the shape of a human being. Because there are agents on assignment. So, guard your heart. When the Bible says, guard your heart, in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart. For it determines the course of your life. Avoid vile affections. Avoid the enemy planting seeds. Timothy wants us in chapter 4, verse 3 to 4. 2 Timothy, I'm going to read that. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Let us be careful that we don't allow ourselves to become the prey willingly because we are desperate for affection, because we are desperate for 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 for, for, for fancy things. We want status, we want the latest car, we want the latest, the biggest house, we want to wear every ashobi that somebody chooses, we want to wear the, the, the red bottom shoes, we want to carry the latest handbag, we want to be the happening babe. We want to be the, 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 the bobo. Let us be careful. Let us be careful. Because the enemy is sitting there waiting, waiting for whom to destroy. Whom to destroy. Those of us who are chasing signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are for believers. God performs our signs and wonders in our own lives. He will show you what he will do with you. He, manip he, 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 he manifests right there. The signs and wonders are for the unbelievers to bring them in. Once you know the Lord, you don't need signs and wonders anymore. God performs his miracles. He heals you, provides for you, takes care of you. Once your soul, your spirit is saved, he gives you everything you need. You find everything you need in him. Does it mean we shouldn't expect miracles? No, that's not what I'm saying. But if you go chasing them, the enemy is waiting to show you them. That is why we get into the traps of false prophets and all that that are telling us lies from the pits of hell. Because there are familiar spirits who are hanging around and knows your grandfather's, your great father's, grandfather's history, your great great grandmother's history. So they can come and tell you, we saw this, or we saw this, or this is going to happen because they've seen it happen before. And they've seen the trajectory of the children in that lineage. And and they know that is where they're going to end. They are able to tell you things. And it's not of the Lord. So let's be careful with our itchy ears. Before we hear say that the pastor there we are thumping. For yet another pastor there we are skipping. And we become homemongers in the house of God. Chasing religious whores. May the Lord help us. May the Lord help us. I encourage you. This is called created for fellowship. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He will direct you. You need a husband, he will bring. If it is his will. You need a child, he will bring. If it is his will. I had a friend. She used to say one thing to me, and that stuck with me. Whenever we prayed, she would say, let, let, let God's perfect will be done. Let's God, let God's perfect will be done. And I held on to those words in my heart. Let God's perfect will be done. So when we pray, let us pray according to God's perfect will. And you will see how God will amaze us. How God will surprise us. And the world indeed will know that we serve a living God. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Mighty God, we bless your name tonight. We give you all the glory and all the honor. We worship and we exalt you. We thank you because you are God. You don't need us to make you God. You're God all by yourself. That is why we call upon you.
So we lift up everybody here tonight, including me, oh Father. In any way I've opened myself to manipulation, I ask that you forgive me. In any way your people here tonight, oh Lord, have opened themselves to manipulation or have used the talent, the gift, whatever it is you have deposited in us, oh Father, to manipulate others. We ask for your mercy and your forgiveness in the name of Jesus yeah. Christ. We ask tonight that every heart, oh Lord, will be pricked. Every heart, oh Lord, will be touched. That the searching, the soul searching that needs to be done, oh Father, it will be done tonight. And give us the grace to pick up your word and read it and spend time in your presence that will not be told lies and be deceived by the men and women of this world, by agents on assignment. And in all of this, let your name be praised. We thank you, Father, for in Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Josephine, thank you for joining us. I'm going to call you after night, after today, okay? All right. Good night, everybody.